Today, I'm going to talk about the 10 greatest challenges that I have had as an entrepreneur now for almost 20 years and then what I did to overcome those 10 seemingly impossible barriers to my success and impact. So the first challenge that comes to mind that I really had to find a way to navigate and overcome was that early on when I was a solo founder, I hired one person to join me. And this one person was super talented, but he wasn't the be all end all, he was just my first person. And as a result of being my first person, he felt that he was my co-founder. But we were already multiple seven figures a year into the business. I heavily invested into it. We were years into this business. I mean, I removed all that initial risk, but because he was in a room alone with me every day, in his mind, he was my co-founder, but he wasn't actually my co-founder. He wasn't qualified to be my co-founder. He didn't have the skills needed to be my co-founder. He didn't make my life easy enough to be my co-founder. And as we started to recruit and build out a team, he felt that like from a hierarchy perspective, that he was above people that I was hiring that actually had years of experience on him and so many additional skills that he would, he just didn't have a chance to, to, to develop yet because he was so young. And it really created tension between us in a significant way because in his mind, he was my co-founder. He thought he should have 25% equity in the business. He thought he should have a certain compensation plan. And the reality is he just wasn't there yet. Like when he looked in the mirror, he saw something that he wasn't, but it was my fault because everyone on planet earth, their greatest strength is also their greatest weakness. And my greatest strength is hyping people up, exciting them, helping them realize what's possible that they may have not seen within themselves, but then they have to be able to rise up and actually be what I'm saying about them. And he did not rise up to what I was saying about him, which is the reason when we recruited, I had to bring on additional talent that actually had the skills that I was hoping that he would have developed. And it was a significant challenge led to him deciding not to work with me anymore. It was emotionally challenging for me because I loved him, but one piece of advice for you is that never build somebody up to be more than 5% of who they are. It's a really important lesson. Build your team up so they feel more than what they are, but only 5% more. Because anything Bob 5%, they're going to come crashing down. Let them rise into it. Let them earn it. Let them become that 5% more than who they are. I built him up to 250% more than who he was. So he actually believed what I said versus reality. And then the whole relationship came crashing down. And that was my first real lesson and challenge as an entrepreneur starting to build a team. The second thing that was a challenge is that in early stage entrepreneurship, there's not really a big budget to grow, right? Have you had that experience before? Maybe you're a small business owner. You don't have really a big budget to actually build a viable business and to market. You see people running aggressive Facebook grants and Instagram and YouTube and TikTok. You're like, I want to be one of those people, but I don't have the budget yet. So that's a challenge that I faced as well. When I first launched Synduit, I self-funded this entire company. So I didn't really have a budget to go out and start doing aggressive marketing. But what I did do, and this is a solution to that challenge, is I focused on what I call the ultimate equalizer, which is relationship capital. And I started to pursue people and organizations that had influence over my ideal customer. And then I found ways to ensure win-win outcomes where I would say, okay, this is the offer you're making. If you plug what I'm offering into your offer, it actually makes your offer more valuable and it gives me access to my ideal customer as well. And I'll compensate you for that as a function of the sales generated. It's a really important distinction for you because if you have a small budget in your business and the thought of spending a portion or all of that budget on running Facebook ads and, and doing SEO and doing all these things that are rather expensive, you're going to have to pay before you receive. And there's a limit to how much you can pay because there's a finite number of dollars in your bank account. But if you shift your focus to relationship capital, it's the equalizer. And then you actually pay a percentage of what you gain which means you have an infinite budget to grow your business. And that was the second challenge that I had to overcome. Third challenge is there's this whole premise and people share this with me, I just didn't honor it, is to hire slow, fire fast. And this was something that I've learned the hard way because I just see the best in human beings. And sometimes even what I'm seeing, although that might be their best, it's not the best for the actual company. So I just encourage you, as you start building out your organization, 
hire slow, make sure the candidate is the right candidate. But the moment you see they're not, address it, 30 day notice. If things don't change, let them go. In service of them and in service of what you're building as well. There have been countless people that I just held on to for too long, even though I knew that they were wrong. I knew that they weren't even growing. So it was like a disservice that I even kept them in the first place. But my heart was for them and I felt badly letting them go. And as a byproduct, held on too long. The third challenge that I had to overcome was to hire slow and fire fast. My fourth challenge that I had to overcome as an entrepreneur is that I really wanted to find a way to make myself obsolete. I didn't want the weight of the world relying on me and my shoulders, my ability to bench press it and squat it. So I had to find some mechanism to not be needed. Because I remember one day, this is years ago, looking to remove myself from the company for one day and I realized, if God forbid, we had a big team at this point, I got hit by a bus today, the entire company goes out of business. I am the glue between every division. I'm the one that catches things when they fall. I'm the one that takes 100 responsive responsibility for everything if it doesn't go right. And that's just not a viable business. And if that's you, I hate to break it to you, it's not a viable business. So I had to find some mechanism to make myself obsolete. So what I did was I top rated talent. I went out and I hired people that had skills far that far surpassed mine in areas where I was good, I wasn't great. I wanted to wake up every day feeling insecure about not being the most valuable person on the team and having other people that actually exceeded my value within their domain. Once I did that, I realized I'm still the source of all sales. How do I make myself not responsible for all sales? How do I make myself obsolete as the voice and the face of the company? So what I did is I started to private label our software in different industries and in different companies so that there was someone like me within an industry or a company that cared as much as I cared about their instance of our software and they became the voice and face of it. And all of a sudden, I became obsolete. And I encourage you to find your path to no longer being the most important person on your team. Because the longer you're the most important person on your team, you are the thing suppressing your growth. You are the thing suppressing your freedom. And that was a challenge that I overcame. I wanted to become obsolete. I've now done it. It allowed me to pursue other passions, dreams, aspirations, and callings. And I encourage you to do the same. The fifth challenge that I had to overcome is that I do not believe that you should ever keep score in any human dynamic. I believe that you should be fanatically focused on giving way more than you receive, 5149. But there's a caveat to this. It's 5149. It's not 100, zero. Really critical. And as someone that might be a go-giver that is really committed to doing positive things in this world, you're the ultimate change maker in your human dynamics. I don't care if it's at home in your personal life or in your business life. If the other party is not showing up and giving anything, that's an opportunity cost to you. Because there's only so many relationships you can really form synergies with. And if you're forming a synergy where you're giving 100% and you're getting 0% in return, that is taking a very coveted spot. It is taking very coveted real estate in your relational life. And what you need to do is not necessarily like have a fight with the person, but just shift your attention and time to someone or something that at least gives you 49% in return. It's not about keeping score. It's about being hyper aware of what's producing a one plus one equals way more than two outcome. I say infinity. It's so critical. And I've had, I don't even know how many, dozens and dozens of relationships in business where I'm all in 100% giving all of myself to the human dynamic, getting nothing in return, and I just held on too long because I didn't want to keep track. I didn't want to keep score. I didn't even want to confront it. And then all of a sudden I realized I've spent a year and all I've done is give, 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 give. I've gotten nothing, not even four or 9%, nothing in return. And I could have done that same effort into someone that had the same philosophy as I had or arm wrestling for 51, 49. And as a byproduct, we both would achieve more. Both of us would have achieved more than me giving 100% to that dynamic do an audit of your relationships, not so you can keep track, but just so that you can ensure that you have relationships that are producing significantly more together than you could produce on your own.
The sixth challenge that I had to overcome, and this was a big lesson for me as an early entrepreneur, is that you need to be willing to pivot if what you're doing isn't growing the business to the degree that it should. So for me, as an example, when I first launched Syntuit, which was originally a marketing agency, I hit a plateau pretty quickly. And that plateau was a function of me doing custom marketing agency work across a diverse pool of clients, really, really diverse pool of clients. And that's just what it was. It all had very specific needs. I had a tiny team at the time and we just plateaued. There was only so much that we could produce. And I held on too long to this very diverse client pool. And then all of a sudden I realized something one day, if I were to still offer agency quality services, but I had more clients within the same sphere, which for me was health, I could take things that I was creating for one client and modify a template. And then once I modify the template, I was done with the work for that client versus creating everything from scratch. Because there was a point in time we were working with financial service providers, we were working with speakers, with authors, with people in healthcare. It was such a diverse pool of clients. So my only way to scale was to hire more people, but sometimes I couldn't justify it from a resource allocation perspective. So we decided to go all in on health entrepreneurs that had a certain budget for their marketing spend. And we were able to take things that were 100% done for one client, remove a few things, it was now 80% done for another client, and then complete that work significantly faster, which allowed us to grow. Be willing and open to pivot. Be willing and open to change. You have the permission to change your mind whenever you want. You don't have to ask for that permission. You have the permission to do it. My sixth, seventh challenge was this, and this is something that I share all the time with our team today, which is I didn't realize that business was made up. Like, I didn't realize that. Like, when I went into entrepreneurship, I didn't realize the whole premise, like, make it up to make it real. I, I thought there was, like, some rule book that I had to abide by as an entrepreneur until I was immersed in it. I realized there's, there's no boundaries to what's possible. I have to just make it up. And when I make it up, I then have to commit to making it real. And when I started thinking that way, I had a whole new set of for pet perspective to what it meant to grow and develop an organization. And I hope that you're now really listening to this point because so many business owners, when they first get started as an entrepreneur or small business owners, they think there's a playbook. They think there's a rule book and there just isn't. Obviously don't break the law. That goes without question. Obviously don't hurt other people, but there's no rules. You make the rules, you make it up to make it real. And the quicker you realize that, the quicker you start to create and build things of real immense value. And that should be your ultimate goal as an entrepreneur, build things of value. The eighth lesson I learned is this, and this was a challenge I had to overcome. And now it's been just, it's a resounding principle in my life is sell before you build. And I used to not do that. I used to build things and then I would sell them. So I remember back in the day, I created this really compelling course. It was so comprehensive, 30 different modules in the course, really valuable, it took me months and months to create, and I launched into crickets. There was no buyer for this course. It wasn't really a relevant topic. No one was really interested. I think I got under 10 sales. Each sale was $1,000. That's $10,000 of sales, and I put like six months into creating this thing. You want to make sure that you sell things before you build them. And you have to have a KPI that is your non-negotiable KPI. If you don't hit $25,000 in sales, you're not building this thing and you give everybody back a refund. And then you're off to doing something that actually can produce value in your life. Because the one thing that you don't have an unlimited amount of is your time. So what I don't want to see you do is spend six, nine, 12 months creating something for no one. What I'd rather see you do is spend 30 to 60 days selling air, see if anybody's willing to pay for your air, if you get enough people to pay for your air, that you deliver on what they bought. But if you don't get enough people or anyone to pay for your air, then you don't put the time into it. And don't, don't at all think that you're lacking integrity by doing this. You're gonna give anyone back a refund if you don't actually deliver, but at least you're not gonna waste your time building something for crickets because crickets don't have credit cards. So you definitely don't want to create something that no one's actually going to pay for. And that was the eighth challenge that I had to overcome as an entrepreneur. The ninth challenge that I have had to overcome as an entrepreneur, and I know many of you are probably experiencing this as well, and it's really critical, 
is the discipline around economics. This is a really significant challenge because the public education system and, and education at large, they don't teach financial literacy. So it's up to us to take the responsibility to become financially literate. And when I first became an entrepreneur, I was not financially literate. And I didn't have the discipline around my economic spend. It was kind of whatever felt right is what I would do. But there wasn't discipline. There wasn't levers. So what I ended up creating, and we've applied this now across our entire portfolio of early stage companies, is called a KPI roadmap. And the way that this works, and you need to create one for yourself based on the business that you're in, is that monthly recurring revenue is the driver of access. So what that means is that $10,000 a month, this is the exact spend of that top line revenue. You have different buckets that the 10,000 in revenue is falling into. One bucket should be earnings so that you're starting to build an earnings pool and you just live and die by those buckets. They are non-negotiable. You cannot spend more than the bucket. At 25K a month, you have many additional buckets and then the 25K falls into those buckets and then as a byproduct of that, that's your, that's your budget, that's your spend for each of those specific domains. 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, 500,000, a million dollars a month. I did not have the economic discipline early as an entrepreneur. It hurt me because I wasn't planning appropriately. And now I've enforced this across our entire portfolio. And I encourage you to as well. My 10th challenge that I had to overcome as an entrepreneur is that initially I wasn't ambitious enough. I wasn't going for a moonshot. I was going for something that would definitely make my life better, but it wasn't going to change the world. What I realized in the process is because my goal wasn't ambitious enough is it didn't get enough attention. It didn't open enough doors. It made me a really good living, but it wasn't the type of thing that when people heard it that night at dinner, they were talking about it with their significant other. And then when they went to sleep at night, they were dreaming about it. I want to make sure this lands for you. Get super ambitious, call your shot, and then execute with re relentlessness with perseverance, with everything you have to ensure that you're pacing toward that outcome. Even if you end up falling short, I'm sure you've heard this saying before, reach for the moon, the worst avenue you land amongst the stars. You need to start having a moon shot. Have something that's so significantly ambitious that it actually makes you a little bit uncomfortable saying it, and then call that shot. The moment I started doing that, doors opened up, different levels of access were born, relationships emerged out of nowhere that were accelerators for what I was ultimately looking to do. And guess what? I'm going to exceed that moonshot now because I called my shot. And that's another challenge that I had to overcome. And I hope that you benefited. These were the 10 most pressing challenges that I have faced as an entrepreneur, the solutions I deployed to turn these challenges to opportunities for growth. And I can't wait to see which one benefits you the most.